There we are. So my name is Gustav Kaiser, and I'm working for an American company called Styra, or Styra in Swedish. I think you have the same word in Dutch. It means actually steering or controlling or something. And the reason we picked that is one of the founders is Finnish, speaks Swedish, and Styra.com was free. That's the whole story, and then comes the Vikings. Let's, oops, now I might have pressed double. So, what are we doing, actually? We're doing authorization. So I'm not an identity company, I'm not an authentication company, we are an authorization company. The first question I usually ask here is, have anyone heard about OPA or Open Policy Agent before? Anyone in the audience? Is it totally new? We have a Martin, of course, and we have some people at uh, Scale Access who's actually using OPA. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening and why we created OPA. We are a rather young company. We were founded in 2016, and we released OPA to open source in 2018. Uh, this is where we all come from. This is what uh, happened when I joined Identity 2006 at Sun Microsystem. We had monoliths. Uh, we were working with big applications, more or less. We had actually just started to externalize authentication that we have done now, and, and a little bit other stuff. But every authorization code was written in the application. And it worked quite OK. You can do audit on an application. You can do policy changes. It's cumbersome, but you can do it when you have a couple of 100 up to a few thousand applications in a company. What we are really talking about is the cloud native landscape. People don't have like a few hundred or a few thousand applications in a big bank. They will have tens of thousands of microservices. That's the new world. And that's where developers are working. So they are actually breaking up the application in pieces. Yes, we have decentralized or decoupled authentication today. Everyone is getting a Java token, some scoop and claims, and we're using that in our application. We have externalized the API management to API gateways. No one is writing APIs in code yet. You're working with service mesh, the communications between the microservices, that's also externalized. And the next thing we see now is people starting to externalize the authorization from the microservices. And the idea is that you should be able to write microservices fast, and you should be able to manage them at scale. Because I talked to a CISO actually at a German traveling company located here in Amsterdam, and she said already here, when we're working with PII and regulated data, she spent one to two days a week, March to September, with auditors, proving that the PII data, payment data, and things like that were compliant. And that was when she had monoliths. When she moving to a microservice environment, she needed to do that not one time, not a hundred times, but a thousand times, because they needs to prove, and this is what people tell me who actually have implemented this, that you are compliant for every microservice. Every bits and piece of your infrastructure or your code is going to be audited in one way or another, and you're going to change policies. And that's why we created OPA. So OPA has a rather bold statement. We're going to solve the authorization across all of the cloud native stack. So that's really the bold statement. And if you think about it, what we're telling people is you're going to start writing applications in a new way in a few years. That's really what we're telling people. And are we on track? So I've been there a year now. I started September last year as the first employee in Europe. Now we are seven as of last week, so we are growing. We had two customers. Now we have a dozen customers. We will soon have our first customer in the Netherlands in a few weeks, I hope, or something like that. And we are at a uh, company started looking at us, looking at Portbase, for example. And uh, Cloud Access has actually an OPA built into their system. First of all, uh, OPA, Open Policy Agent, works. We're saying OPA everywhere except Germany. It has another meaning there. Uh, Styra is the company behind it. But OPA is pure open source. So we're an open source company. There is not an enterprise OPA or something like that. OPA is an open source project with a big traction at the moment. I'm only going to show you one technical slide. This is it. So what OPA really is, is a very, very lightweight application. You send it to JSON question, any JSON format. We have uh, policies in a language called a Rego that we evaluate with data you send in or data we have stored, or data we catch and we send back a policy decision. That's what the OPA do. 
And as I said, we're a part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. We've been really going in a fast track there. We actually entered Sandbox 2018 and graduated as, I think, project number nine here in 2021. So there are we, there are Kubernetes, and there are some other projects. Uh, really, really interesting part. And really why I'm talking to you now is that I've spent a year, and I'm, I'm an indented man like you, or, but I'm talking to developers for a year, because it's developer who is embracing and implementing externalized authorization. And they're doing a great job at point solutions. They have a problem, they solve it. But when we're going to implement this at scale, I need to talk to you, because identity people are extremely good at implementing robust system that's going to live for years at scale. That's not really what developers are looking for. They have a problem, they solve it, and tomorrow they have a new problem. This is really what's happening during my year. So when I joined, we had 7 million downloads, and I think, okay, it's a big project. Last week, we passed 100 million downloads at OPA, so it's really being embraced. Uh, we had like, I think I was Slack user, 1,900 or something. This morning we passed 4,900 Slack users. So on the Slack channel, looking like this, there are like 4,900 happy developers talking about open policy and talking about externalized authorization every day. And I urge you, join here, listen in, look at what people are doing. The other thing is the flexibility. Because normally we talk here microservice APIs, databases, that's the authorization, that's the identity space. I spend not as much time, but probably 30, 40% of my time talking to the platform guys. Because that's when you come to governance, authorization, and things like that. Which work those can I deploy? Is my container secure? Is it scanned? Does it come from a trusted register? Things like that. Because we all talk DevSecOps. But I was at a, an event in Hamburg two weeks ago, which was a container days. And they all talked about DevOps, but I didn't meet a single developer. It was all platform people. And when you go to another thing, is more, de is more developers. You haven't really seen the DevOps. But people are really trying to do that. And that really means that developers are going to do operations. So developers are going to ship containers and put things in production. And then you need to have the same set of policies. And that's really what we're setting up to do. So I'm going to come to how you tie all of this together at the end. Uh, use cases, as I said, the beauty of the open policy agent is that it's used across all of the stack. Uh, I can be totally honest, the Kubernetes and mission control wasn't what we set out to solve. It was just a use case to pop up later on. Because what we really set out to solve was the founders, Tim and Tema, built a switch at layer 3 or 4, a software switch that is sold them to VMware, and then they got the question, could we do this? Because it's a really zero trust engine on layer 7. They got that from the banks that were implementing it in the US. And they said, yes, we can do that, but then we need to build another project and they build open policy agent. But today, people are using it. The biggest use case is Kubernetes and mission control. It's not really what I'm talking about, because that one is embedded in Azure, it's embedded in Amazon, it's embedded in Google, and it's an open source project called OPA Gatekeeper. We have a solution as well, but mostly it's covered pure open source. What I'm talking about is application microservice. Uh, the last thing we saw was a week and a half ago when actually Kong announced that both in Kong and Kuma today, there is an open policy agent built in the actual in latest version. So you don't need to deploy it, it's already there. You just need to put in the policies. And then we have some Terraform validation. I don't know if everyone here knows what it is, but it's also when you're working with infrastructure as code or policy as code in the infrastructure place. In more interesting here, and why we all should care, and why you actually should go and ask your development, are you looking at something like externalized authorization? Are you doing small proof of concept with OPA? Or do you already have it in production? This is why people are doing it. And this comes from the latest survey that we published a month ago, something, where 200 of our customers actually answered, why are you using OPA? Why did you start using Open Policy Agent? 
And the biggest one is actually internal compliance and governance. And that's why we're doing identity. While ease of use and things like that is, of course, interesting for us, but actually we would never be funded if we didn't have like, compliance and governance issues. So that's the main thing. The other thing is, of course, I say operation excellent. The third was a little bit surprise to me, end user identity and access management. And when that comes in is really the API side when you do some digging. Because what you really want to do when you have APIs, you don't want to have one API for every use case, or one API for every customer. You want to have rather broad APIs and then control them by policies to lock them down what people can do at that effects. That's actually what we're seeing. And external compliance, as I say, audits and things like that, is also one of the biggest use cases. The business case, what people are telling me, because when I joined a year ago, I said we had two customers in Europe. Uh, now I have a dozen, more or less, and we have like 60 on a global scale. So we're a rather young company, but now we're actually getting the feedback. Like every startup, the first like, embracement are more the technical people that really like the idea, but now we're getting actually the value. So we have been able to have this conversation now with, in Europe, a handful of customers see, what's the return on investment? Did it pay out as you think? And the feedback is rather straightforward. Yes. If you just look at an OPA, you're actually not getting the benefit. The benefit is when people come to me and say, well, we want to deploy OPA at scale. And the first thing that you need to understand is you will not get any benefit if you don't make policies consistent. If you let every development tribe just solve their own solutions, you will still have a mess, to be honest. You need to find a way to centrally control and govern your policies and your authorization. If you do that, you can have consistent policies. And having consistent policies or consistent security in a company, that's the key. Because when you have that, you can get some really, really nice benefit. No repeated work, everyone tells me at the beginning. Well, if we write a policy once, and then all the other teams can use it, we will save a lot of money. Not really, to be honest. You will save some money, because people will reuse the policies, but that's not really where the big savings are. The big savement comes in fast security reviews. Instead of doing security reviews on Eve, every microservice, every API, with a central control plane on top of OPA, you can do it in a central way. You can see all the logging, all the decision that has taken place. You can see the policies that are in place. You can simulate who can have access and things like that. And what are people telling me, this is also the business case when they get the funding, they save over 90% on audit compared to do it on the microservices. And that's just when they are in the first phase of rolling out OPA. Because no one has actually done it more than two years. Most people are like 12 months into them. OPA journey. The other thing that people tell me will save a lot of money. They have seen they have started to see it, but not as much as when they change policies. Because today, if a regulation change, if there comes some new laws, or if you do a reorganization, and you need to change your authorization policies, you need to change them in 50 microservices. You need to redeploy 50 microservices. In this case, you can change the policies, push them out to the OPAs, and change it in one go. So people are saying, that will save us even more money. And when I really ask them, have you done this? And people say, mm, yes, we have tried it, but policies don't change every week. Policies don't change every month. But they do change. Maybe on a yearly or twice a year or something. But we will see these one coming more and more. The other thing is just more like if you have an API, if you have a service mesh, yes, there are things that will help you. But these are the three main drivers, I would say, that the developers are coming to me and that governance are coming to me and talk about. The other thing is the number of use cases, and it goes back to the flexibility. What we see now, people come in with a Kubernetes use case, then come in with an API use case or a microservice use case, but it tends to grow to other use cases. The use cases tend to expand, but also uh, if you're taking and starting with Kubernetes, then after a while, your microservice or your tribe start to talk to us as well. Or 
at SAP actually I started with one department in SAP, then I find another department, and now we're talking to five departments. So it's more like isolated islands popping up. And that's the beauty and downside with working with open source, because it's really easy to get started, but deploying at scale. And that's really, I used to work with SACML solution for four years, and I always then started to say, this is a PDP, this is a policy, this is how we should work with it. Today I never do that. Everyone that I talk to come and say, well, we know OPA, we have used OPA, we have tested OPA, this is a five minute mark, but now we want to deploy it at scale. And that's really my message to you. You have people out there in your organization. If you are developing your own software one way or another, and if you are regulated, people are looking at Open Policy Agent or maybe some other solution. But in order to get all these working at scale, you need to have a central governance. Because having people writing policies with no, without any governance, without any testing, without any approval change and audit change, you're just creating a new problem for you. And that's where Styra come in. We created OPA, we released it to open source. And yes, we sell support on OPA like every open source company, but we also have an offering that we call a Styra DAS. It's a software as a service running out on Amazon in Frankfurt for Europe, or uh, you can have it on-prem, but companies like Zalando, Deutsche Bahn is actually running on our SaaS tenant down in, uh, down in Germany. But what we are really doing, we have a, and I can give you a demo on that later on, is a way to write the policies, version control the policies, test and impact the policies before they get in production. What will this change actually be? Who will not have access? Will it change at 10% or 20%? We make sure the right set of OPAs get the right set of policies. We can check that they have the right set of policies. We will have a central plane on logging and also a central way for your auditors to go in and test who can access this kind of PII data and who has accessed this PII data. Uh, this is just a slide proving my point. Like, you see Zalando come in with microservice, now they're doing container orchestration and things like that. Deutsche Bahn actually started that away and going upward. Uh, and this is just a little short list of some of our customers. Uh, questions? Now I've been talking <laughs> oh, that was great. 15 any, minutes. Any questions for a brief question? Yeah. Uh, in the big days, I, I was also developing some code, where, uh, where especially when you code for banks and financial institutions, SAS does are really important, uh, static application security testing, yeah. dynamic application security testing. I'm trying to position this solution. Do you think it's part of the dust area? Because it, it has really a strong security component in it when you talk about policies and, and verifying your application and access to it. Is it part of the dust or is it a different area where you would position the solution? What do we mean with DAS in that? Dynamic application security testing. So yes. the, the behavioral no, no. Uh, security part of your application when you develop that. This is a runtime, so it's not when you're writing the code and testing the applications. It's the runtime security. Who can access things in runtime? Oh, so it's also integrated in production itself? Yeah. So it's when I'm logging in to a bank, uh, I'm trying to, I'm working at the bank, can I then see my own bank details for a second? That's a policy, so it's a runtime application. So we're having a small container called the OPA attached to the microservice. We're going back to the technical slide uh, down here. And the microservice, when they get the request, is asking OPA if this is allowed to do that or not. Okay. So it's not when you're writing the code in that case. That's the Styradas component. Then, okay, so I'm writing this policy, mm -hmm. which impact will that have? And I say, well, of the last 1,200 decisions taken, 800 will get a new result. Maybe not the good idea to put that in production. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it's a splendid idea, but you should know the impact. But yeah. someone else might need to approve that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Clear. <laughs> thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, good. Um, thank you. Thank you for speaking.